speaking on the topic driving organizational performance through effective strategic execution. He himself is a strategist and has played a role as a strategist in many organizations. But one important thing to us today is the fact that he drives a lot of efficiency and promotes a lot of efficiency through teamwork. He also is an amazing gentleman, an astute one, and a very funky one as you will meet him eventually as he comes on. He has got a lot of experience under his belt. Please forgive me if I make some of these quite colloquial. <laughs> I don't want it to be too much of serious business. Yes. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, I think I can relate to this highly relatable. And he's the best person you would ever meet anywhere else. Coming from one of our major sponsors, our platinum sponsor for today, he's from the Bulk Oil Storage and Transportation Limited. And he is none other but the Managing Director of BOSS. Please, let's welcome Mr. Edwin Robinson. Good morning, again. Uh, once again, I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to be the, the only ghost alive. But those who understand what I'm saying, you know. And I'm happy to be alive today. Uh, you for saying the happy birthday again. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about 
us what we do because then it sets a context for which the journey began. And then we'll look at the post in 2017, the state of the company in 2017. I joined in 2019, uh, but it's, it's better to go back to see the state of the entity in 2017. And then we'll look at post today. And the boss today is where a lot of the things that you have learned, uh, project management, agility, etc., teamwork, scope, cost, schedule, risk, stakeholder. I have the biggest stakeholder group in this country. And my stakeholders, my stakeholders are so powerful. And they all work against each other. They all have different objectives that they are all trying to optimize or maximize. And uh, we'll look at that. And then we'll look at the role of projects and how we used the, everything you have learned to achieve what we have achieved today and then the, how the future moves. But let me start by saying that I have not done this by myself. I have done it, this thing as a result of having some brilliant people working with me and then some brilliant board members, especially my board chairman, amazing guy, who supported everything we have done. Uh, my management team, some of who are here. Uh, my strategy team is here though. Project management team, some of them are here. My task mistress is here as well. She's the one there. Mama, can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, every every year on my birthday, I go and I go to an, my adopted orphanage. Fortunately, Mommy made sure that I won't go there today. She said, You have to be here to do this thing. So when I came this morning, I was quite sad. But like she is, she said, sir, you've already committed to this. You cannot not come. <laughs> so I push them to next year. So yes, um, I also want to acknowledge the, the uh, SIGA and the uh, Auditor General. A lot of people fear auditors, but auditors are my best friends. Well, they are the only ones who can come and identify the rot in the system and tell you, and then over time you fix it. If you see them as your enemy, you never improve. If you see them as your development partner, you always improve because they are the only ones who see what you don't see. And they played a key role in this journey. Uh, I talked about my management team as well. Okay, so um, what is our mandate in Bost? The first mandate for BOST, there's a reason why today you have fuel in Akosobo at the same price of the fuel in Accra. So there's price parity as you travel along, even though there's a transportation cost because the fuel has to be moved from one place to another. But, I, good. but then there's price parity as you go along. So, our first mandate is to develop and maintain a national network of facilities for the bulk storage, transportation, and distribution of petroleum products in this country. That means that we have to build pipelines to transfer the molecules. We have to build storage tanks in certain locations to hold the petroleum products in there. So that as demand is needed, it is sent to the demand centers. We have to sometimes buy badges. And the badges, if you go on to, you're in a Kosovo now. If you go look, uh, if you drive up a little bit, you'll see our badges packed there. We have about four badges. And so we have a pipeline connecting Tema to a Kosovo. And when it gets to a Kosovo, it's loaded onto the badges. And then there is a tugboat there that belongs to us as well. That 
pulls the barges along the Akosombo Lake all the way to Buipe in the north. At Buipe, we also have a depot there where the molecules are loaded into the tanks in the depot and then pumped again from uh, Buipe to Borga. On the way, the pressure drops. So we have a booster station at Samelugu, which boosts the pressure again until the molecules get to Borga. And then the OMCs come to the depots to come and move the molecules to the demand centers, which is the four stations you see. So our role is so critical in making this, uh, this energy available for economic development in this country. And so the first mandate is meant to do that, to make sure that we have reliable infrastructure that can do this very safely. Then the second mandate is to help provide strategic reserves up to six weeks uh, for this country so that you and I, in the event that something happens and we cannot bring in refined products, we will have some products in house and in country so that you and I can still live our normal life up until we repair the fault or up until we restore the flow of petroleum products. This particular mandate, uh, we have not effectively delivered it. And there's a reason why. This mandate is like uh, an insurance for the country. Huh? All right? Uh, for those, I'm sure all of you own cars. Uh, who pays your insurance for you? You pay yourselves. Eh? Now, this insurance policy here that the nation wants for us to execute, who do you think should be paid? Who does the insurance benefit? The people of Ghana. So who should be paying the premiums? <laughs> <laughs> she said that the people of Ghana benefit. But when it comes to the payment, it's a government of Ghana. <laughs> okay, so, so that is why we haven't effectively delivered this. Because the people who benefit from this insurance are not paying the premiums for the insurance. Policy. The reason is that in 2006, there used to be uh, a strategic reserve levy on the petroleum price buildup. As we speak, that line you have zero. And it's been zero since 2006. Eh? So it means that nobody is paying the premium for this insurance. Now, this premium. It's, we need about $370 million to be able to achieve this six weeks of storage and maintain it. Now, would it be wise for a for-profit company like me, like MTN, like ECG, like Vodafone, to go ahead and take a loan from the bank and buy $360 million and buy petroleum products and stop. Would it be wise for us to do that? It would not be wise for us to do that or else we can't pay back the loan. So when I'm asked whether do you have strategic reserves, how many do you have? I say, oh, I have some inventory in stock. They are not strategic reserves, even though they are all the same molecules. But I don't call them strategic reserves. I call them my inventory. Because when you come that you want to buy, I will sell it to you because I have to go and pay back the money I have borrowed. So my take is that eventually there has to be a, a national discussion by the policymakers, 
on how to finance this insurance policy. So this insurance policy, that's the reason why I'm not delivering it so well. These three mandates sometimes conflict, and I'll explain why. You see this first mandate, it is both a mandate for profit, because I'm the company, I need to make some money for my shareholder. And it's also a social mandate. Why is it a social mandate? It is a social mandate because sometimes when I build my uh, infrastructure in the deprived areas who need energy, the demand is so low there that I'm not able to make an economic return. But when I build it in Tema, where almost all the businesses are and the capital is, I make an economic return. So if you look at all the uh, private depots in Ghana, where do you think all of them are situated in? In Accra, Tema. All of them are in Tema. I am in Tema, I am in Akosombo, I am in Kumase, I am in Pripe, I am in Sabelugu, I am in Bolga. You get what I mean? And the reason why I am in those places is that the shareholder is government. And government says, you have to do it there. So I do it there. But the same government also wants me to turn, make a return on this, an economic return on the investment. So I lease some of these assets. That's how I make money. So when uh, somebody can, somebody imports fuel and they, they don't need to build a new depot to store, they bring the fuel into my tank and then they pay a fee for storage. When I transport the fuel through my pipelines as well, I make some small money. Uh, that's how I make money. And when I import the fuel and I sell, I make some money. So this one is a dual mandate, social and for profit. If you look at this, is there any profit mandate here? The second one. I'm coming. The second one, is there any profit mandate? No It's strictly social. Alright? Strictly social. Providing security for the people of Ghana, petroleum security. In doing this, does it come at a cost? So who should be paying for the cost? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and then this mandate too, this mandate is a purely profit. Bring in the products, take advantage of Africa Free Trade Continental Agreement and all the agreements, wheel the molecules to Bulga, get them to come to Bulga and then export to them and collect some dollars. So they conflict because sometimes you want to do something, but then there's a social issue, and you still have it's a maze, fine line, and still make money. Okay, this is my network. I think I've talked about this where I am. So I'm here. This when the when the vessel comes, it comes to Tema, then it will through the molecules are will through pipelines to Mami Water. Mami Water, you know Mami Water. Yeah. Okay. On the way, there's Water. On the Adomi Bridge, on the right side of the Adomi Bridge, uh, it's called Bami Water area. Uh, you will through Bami Water. <laughs> you know, you got to... <laughs> Okay, I would say. But then it goes here and then uh, gets to Akusombo. From Akusombo, the budget will be to Bulbe, Savalugu. Booster Station, Bulga, and then to the rest of the country. These are my network, the network assets, six depots, 51 tanks at 425,000 uh, cubic, 36, 361 kilometers of pipeline, four badges, one tank boat, one booster station. Uh, in Kumasi, we don't have a pipeline, so we use the trucks. With all the trucks you see on the road, uh, they, they pick the floor from here to Kumasi to serve these environments. 
uh, and then we don't have anything in um, Takrade. They're not trying to build something in Takrade, but there's some private people there. Uh, in, in so this is the network, this is the infrastructure. There is a political economy to this infrastructure. This is this robust. And I talked about the fact that we have some very powerful stakeholders who conflict each other. Uh, and one of these powerful stakeholders is this guy. <coughs> this guy. What do you think happens to this guy's business? This guy. What do you think happens to his business when these things don't work? What do you think happens to their business? You know, you know, they become millionaires. And I'm serious, when I say they become millionaires, they become real millionaires. Now, who do you think owns these trucks? It's not government of Canada. <laughs> you know, it could be your brother. <laughs> because it's a business. Alright, so it's my brother could own a track, your brother could own a track, a church could own a track, uh, the council of state member could own a track, a minister can own a track, uh, a farmer can own a track. <laughs>
can't even pay for it. 624 million dollars. My MTN brothers were telling me that last between two years they spent like 400 million dollars on their infrastructure. This is just just 624 million dollars. Huge, it's big money, not cities dollars. And then we had some legacy loans of 416 million cities. Little money we have borrowed also to engage in uh, petroleum products. Uh, we had some bulk distribution companies who claim that they have brought some molecules into our storage and the molecules have evaporated. <laughs> so there was a claim, there was a claim of <laughs> there was a claim of 37 million dollars on the company. And then we had a CAPEX liability, an exam loan that we took to help develop some of the infrastructure. We had an uh, exam CAPEX liability of $109 million. So on the financial side, this was the burden of the company. And it's, it's serious, serious matter. Very serious. On the infrastructure side, In 2008, we, have, we took, we are in 2023. In 2008, we have bought some pipelines. And as of 2021, it was still stuck in Houston. Worth millions of dollars. And this is government money. Stuck in Houston. The pipeline that connects Accra to Tema to uh, Akosombo, Tema to Akosombo Petroleum Pipeline, uh, TAP, it was not functional. No. The Borga to Bupi Petroleum Pipeline, B2B3, Borga to Bupi Petroleum Pipeline. That one to on the Akosomo Dam, we have some marine assets, four tag, two tag, one tag boat, four barges, and a floating dock. They were grounded, 100% of that. Our depots, 15, 15 out of 51 times. They uh, were not functional. Three out of our six depots were also not functional. All these are revenue earning assets. So as of 2017, our revenue earning assets was around 17%. Who do you think was benefiting from this? Your mother in
founders of the company uh, at that time, 1993, 1993. And the wisdom of the founders of the company, because they acknowledged that we provide some social services, they said that, okay, because you put your infrastructure in very unprofitable areas in these countries, let's vote a margin so that you can use it to maintain the infrastructure as you work. So in 2011, uh, the boss margin was 3 per liter. In 20, after 2019, the boss margin was still 3 per liter. How they have. <laughs> so that was it. And then we have some legal contingent liabilities. A lot of people are taking us to court for various reasons. <clears throat> some of them you just can't understand why. But 161 million cities, those that we deal will lose. You know, sometimes you go to court, you know this one, you will lose. That we're still going to continue. 161 million Ghana cities. So, this was the state of your company called Bost. And I say your company because it's 100% owned by government of Ghana. But in this state, there were other stakeholders who were laughing to the bank. Big time. They were building huge houses. They were going for holidays with their friends and families. Everybody else, the staff, everybody else were suffering because we couldn't even pay salaries at that time. We, an oil company that goes for overdraft to pay salaries at this time, it was terrible. Okay, this was the state of the infrastructure. Everything was virtually gone. Okay. These were the pipelines sitting in the weather in, the, in Houston. The rain, the snow, the sunshine. Since 2008. This is the equipment. That guy there. You know, I'm sitting there. That guy was in there. Sitting there. <laughs> we had very high capital work in progress. Our head office that became a big issue in this country and stalled for almost four years because of when you marry politics with business, the outcomes don't come out well. That is it. And then you had some equipment that we have bought that was sitting in these containers. So it was it was terrible. Okay. So then in 2019, I used to be the advisor to the Minister of Energy before I became a uh, boss. That's another story. But in 2019, I was asked to go and see whether we could do something. And I remember that I'm a PMI member, I lie. Yes. I can't disgrace that. Doctor, Togby will not forgive me. <laughs> so what did we know? The economics in me came to mind. To say, let's define the problem. Knowing all the things we know, what problem are we facing in simple terms? And this was our problem, our problem definition. We wanted to deliver the core mandate profitably by maximizing return on our assets, for which only 17% could earn revenue. Subject to everything I've talked about. No money, high debt, uh, 
stakeholders, interesting stakeholders with conflicting objectives. Uh, the culture, I'm sure you were your contamination, our brand was bad, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et but that was we defined the problem. Then I told you I'm a balance scorecard guy. With the originators of the balance scorecard is Kaplan and Norton. That is Norton, that is Kaplan. And they trained me. I couldn't disgrace them as well. So I had PM I watching me. And I have doctors, Kaplan and Norton, to watch me. Seeing that whether I could use the tool, it is a strategy execution tool to help Ghana. What is the balance scorecard? Simply in simple terms, it's a framework that helps organizations translate strategy into operational objectives. My favorite part is here, that drive behavior and performance. So if you execute it very well, what it does is that it changes the behaviors of the whole organization towards performance. And that is powerful because human beings have behaviors. All right? The behavior could be inimical to the organization or it would enhance the organization. And so if you have a tool that can help you drive those behaviors together, all of us, towards a performance-based culture, then we knew that we had hope. And I knew that. But now I have to make sure that almost 490 people behind me also believe that we could put in a system that can help drive behaviors that would achieve performance. Don't escape this. I also knew that if we did this very well, we could get an execution premium. An execution premium is that you would deliver more than what is expected from a normal company working. So if the normal company working was making a 10% return on investment, I can, using the methodology, I can deliver a 50 to 60 execution premium. And the execution is getting things done, knowing how to get things done. You know some Ghana, we talk a lot, you know that. We talk a lot. We go the conferences we have in Ghana. You don't have an idea. They don't translate to performance. And so I'm a, an action guy. So I knew that I had a tool that would give me this premium. So if the normal firms are doing 24 percent, I knew that with the right motivation and the right framework. I could get boss to be delivering 150% and apart. And that's the execution premium. Okay. So what did we do? We started the journey. I told you I'm a management consultant. Uh, so, and I'm an engineer. And uh, I'm a small finance guy. And I'm an economist. <laughs> so we started with a strategy team. I put together a strategy team headed by some handsome man there who's also a PMI guy. I took give me, give me, let them see you. Get up and let them see you. <laughs> so my strategy team, we had to, I had to invest hours to get them to understand. He talked about knowledge. He talked about knowledge. Dr. Moses talked about knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. So we need to make sure that they have the knowledge. And once they have the knowledge, they will know what I know. And then together, we can start impacting the organization. So we started a journey to find out what was happening. And it was all inclusive. So this is this beautiful lady. She's a PMI lady as well. She's sitting there. Yeah. Okay, can we see you? Can I play the scene? 
She's a PMI as well. Go and see. PMI they deliver out. So you see all these basa basa things you are doing here. There's a meaning to it. There's a science to it. And you see this chick. The taskmaster. Thank you. So we started the journey. And eventually we all agree that we need to move from here to here. Everybody agreed in our company that we didn't like where we are, where but we have to move to here. Stakeholders. We have to engage stakeholders. So we have to go to the ministry, to the civil society organizations, to Elementary subcommittee of mines and energy to plenty of stakeholders, the former MDs, the uh, plenty, see the plenty, the journalists and the media, you know, GRA, Tanka, this powerful group, this is the powerful group, Tanka owners. <laughs> Yoko, Yoko, traditional rulers, some of them own tanks. Trucks! Some of them on the trucks, the traditional rulers. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and we came up with two, our strategy was simple, two prompt. Two prompt. Very simple strategy. Two. Enhance operational excellence and aggressively grow the business. Simple. You can't do that with a bad brand. And you can't do that with a poor culture. Simple. Everybody understood it. And everybody decided to go on the journey. Don't forget that we also have people internally who may own tracks. <laughs> so, you cannot execute a strategy if you don't measure it. So we decided to give, measure our strategy by three key KPIs. So 2021 to 2024, strategy, KPIs. So today, for turnaround time, the three were turnaround time, asset optimization, and revenue market share. Turnaround time, how quickly a truck comes in and gets out. It's, it's, it impacts customer satisfaction. We were doing four hours. We wanted to reduce it to 60 minutes. Difference of three hours. Asset optimization, I told you, 18%. We wanted to get to 70%. Gap of 52. Revenue market share, we're doing around 500 million. We wanted to get to 3 million seeds. Gap of 2.5 billion seeds. That's the seventh stage. Then we had to break that strategy down into objectives in a story form. So that's the story. If you do this very well, you get this. If you do this very well, you achieve this. And if you do this very well, you increase revenue and reduce cost. So that's the story of our strategy. Then comes the projects. Where do the projects come in? We have to identify the 20% most critical projects that will deliver us 80% of value. And that is where your project management comes in. 
It's not only executing the project. Now, there are 10 million projects you can do. Which ones will deliver you the best value in the VUCA world with many stakeholders who have conflicting objectives? And so, why is the project? Today you are here, you want to get to here, you need a project to come in to help you get there, period. Okay. Then, that's where the strategy comes in. All this plenty from a fine talk has stopped talking about now. What does it mean? Who are you going to hold accountable? They are here. What projects are we going to do? They are here. What is the target? What is the strategic measure? What is the corporate ob uh, objective? No nonsense strategy execution. You sign contracts with people. You say, if you deliver, I'll buy you a product. If you deliver, I'll get this. Human beings, they are here. So this is operationalizing the strategy. So then we put that in place. And these are the projects. We are getting the 20% most critical projects we identify. <coughs> then, incentives. So, boss, if we help you achieve all these things, what we will get? Because <laughs> maybe we were getting something before. Now, if we do all this thing, we won't get the data again. Now. So, we have to engage staff and have a social contract with the staff to say, yeah, we're going to do this, everybody's going to benefit from this, you're going to have enhanced training, you're going to do this, we're going to have money to travel for conferences, bonuses, etc., etc., etc. So, staff engagement, I talked about that, plenty, I've got the length and breadth of this country. So what have we achieved now? I'm rounding up. My belief in people is always justified. This same people we had, we decided to let them know that there was a God in them. And we picked a group to make sure that they were trained in Microsoft BI because I we needed reporting. And this is what has come of it. So this automated scorecard was developed by the same people in Boston who nobody knew. It's amazing. Led by my strategy guy. <laughs> so today we know where we are falling short and well in my, in my on my phone, I can tell. We paid off 100% of the 460 million seats. <laughs> the people who claim we owe them 37 million dollars, the same staff that though it was an, uh, one of the big four companies who came to do the audit and said we owe 37 million dollars. We did an internal forensic audit when I came. All the people who said we owe them 37 million dollars now find that we owe them only 11 million dollars, not 37. <laughs> Saving this country 26 million dollars. That's it. Okay. The, this one, that's 624 million dollar trade law. The trade law. I do. We have audited our accounts since 2015, 2016, 2017, up to 2022. We are current. Tax arrears, we are current. Our depots, we fix them. We are now going further to automate the depots. We just signed a depot upgrade contract. It will start in Q3. Our TAPP pipeline. The Montreal Sobo Pipeline is working as we speak. 
We've even gone further to add a leak and intrusion detection system. Why? Because when you pass water through the pipeline, all the water comes out. But when you pass petroleum through us, <laughs> So we have to put in place a leak detection and an intrusion detection system to protect it. That's some very marvelous people in Ghana, eh? <laughs> the, the, the pipeline that was in Houston, as of 2021 December, we brought it back down to them. It's in stops. We'll be laying those 12-inch pipelines. Uh, next year. We've implemented, so these are the soft things. These are the most powerful things in organization. We've implemented 22 new policies. 22 new policies in-house. We have a business risk unit. Uh, our revenue at any asset is now at 98% from 18%. Our badge loading time was seven days load all the badges. Now we load it in two days. Uh, in Tadepo loading time, that was four hours. Now we're doing it in one hour, 30 minutes. Our target is 30 minutes. The automation is what will get us to do that. Uh, we have a robust performance management system. If you don't contribute, you know the job. If you contribute, you go chop plenty. So our bonus system, people the bonuses from zero to like five months salary per year, depending on your performance. And this year, everybody's asking me, sir, when are we paying the bonus? <laughs> so impact on the bottom line, and this is where you will be happy for your company called Bust, and you would give my team a standing ovation. This is us in 2016. You see, we crossed the zero line, and now we are here. These are the numbers. This is profit. 2016, we're making make a loss of 459 million cities. 2017, 2018, we crossed the zero mark. 2021, we made a profit of 164 million cities. As we speak, 2022, the team here, they doubled their profits. Millions It is possible. It is possible. Through these tools, it is possible. So rewarding performance. I told you that I promised them that when the money starts coming, we'll start going for the conferences. All right? I have six of my team members who are going to Harvard for training. Tell you. It is possible. Harvard. Harvard. We're able to afford our, we're giving them world class training. World class trade, and I don't joke with trade because I know what it's done for me and I know what it will do for this country. We are paying bonuses, huge bonuses, and we are winning awards. Can you imagine, boss? Winning awards. How? The brand, I talked about brand and corporate governance. We won an international award in the public sector brand. We won an award in corporate governance by the Institute of Directors and the Internal Audit Agency. How? Most. We won, we won international awards. And that we even won, I was awarded a doctorate degree, but I don't want to know. <laughs> I want the proper doctrine, <laughs> not the ordinary one. 
and that one is coming soon. <laughs> and our our own staff are also winning individual awards. Even the former president acknowledged the work we have done. <laughs> isn't it amazing? It is possible, isn't it? <laughs> I'll leave you. I'll leave you with this. This is what guides me every day. Colossians three, twenty three to twenty four. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance. From the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord you have said, not human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. For every one of you, you are with me. Now I can actually call you, Doctor. Please, I know we are far behind time, but let's allow for uh, two questions, Maxim. Okay, yes, please. The first two hands in that corner over there, yes, let's do that. identified the many challenges that were there and you talk about picking the 20 that will solve the 80. Uh, is it okay to at least point those 20 you pick so that the story is complete? Can I have a slide? Um, if you look at the projects we decided to embark on, the projects we decided to embark on, all the projects we had there were part of the 20%. So these ones, finish TAPP, repair, rehabilitate TAPP, bring the marine assets back to life, repair b 2 b 3 upgrade the depots, finish the Kumasi rehabilitation depot works. Repair all the tanks. They are ninety-eight percent done. Our Volga car park, finish it off. Start up building LPG tanks. Start a to Kumasi pipeline. Repair the uh, replace the twelve-inch pipeline that we brought. Start constructing it to replace this pipeline. Commence on working temporarily. Have strategic partnerships so that you can bring in the petroleum products affordably. I'm sure you know about good for oil. Buy additional marine assets and then grow the people. Grow the people. So these were the 20%. There were so many. We have to prioritize and pick the players. Thank you. Last question. Okay, so um, thanks, Doc, for such a wonderful. Oh, this Doc, fantastic. You just think of it. Oh my God. So, my name is Faisal, um, the board member here in my garden. Nice. And um, I want to find out you know, the journeys um, you've gone through, what are some of the challenges you face? And also, um, some of the internal resistance you came across. Okay, so I'm going to. My biggest challenge and fear. The mother in law's outgoing thing. But the biggest one is can somebody Google Edwin Provencal read? Read, read. All of you Google it. Edwin Provencal read. Read, dead, dead, read. So during Valentine time, some people, I don't know who, decided to give me some Valentine flowers in the form of a wreath. You check, you check. That was my biggest challenge. But that was my biggest motivation as well. 
Because I knew that I was doing the right thing. You get what I mean? But then Colossians 3, 20, 20, 24. God will protect you. That's why I'm happy I'm alive today. Have you seen it? You see the nice flowers, all these nice flowers. And that's why when I came, I said, I am the only little ghost running an exit. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. And there's a big surprise for Mr. Tom, so that is coming to you at the moment.